Now, a number of things make our next guest the perfect person to speak to Rush upon their induction in the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. Maybe it's the growing up in Etobicoke, a vast suburb similar to the places where Rush came of age. Or maybe it was through his music with the Rio Statics that was also uncompromising and boldly original. He has also written eight books, including On a Cold Road and the recent Around the World in 57 and a half gigs. But most importantly, uh, like Jacob, he's a Rush fan. And here to read from his book, For Those About to Rock, please welcome Dave Bedini. As a kid in love with rock and roll, Rush was the first real band with whom I was obsessed. I was partly in a rush because as a 14-year-old kid, I wanted to appear older. Most of the kids two grades above me were into Rush, and partly because, like tobogganing and watching the beachcombers, to follow them was to quietly awaken one's sense of place. Besides, if you weren't into Rush, you were into disco. It was an impossible choice. When it was broken down along these lines, Rush was the only band every guy in my neighborhood cared about. With Lakeside Park from Rush's All the World's a Stage live album, recorded over three nights at Massey Hall, for the first time I identified a local place in a song. Not just a song, mind you, but a kick-ass chunk of molten metal prog rock embellished with roller coaster drum fills, chiming guitar flurries, and Geddy Lee's wild vocals. In other books, I've stated the effect that Stomp and Tom Connors has had on my life, but it was Rush, and to a lesser extent, their cousins in the song, Max Webster, who first sang to me about my home. Around the time that I got into Rush, I met Ronnie. We were 13 years old, and we were both crazy about the band. I first encountered him while walking down the hallway of my high school. At the time, I was wearing my T-shirt with Rush One Toronto spelled on it, which I'd had steam pressed on in spongy white letters at the t-shirt stall in the Albion Mall. <laughs> you like Rush? He asked me. Yeah, man, I love Rush. Cool, wanna hang out? Okay. <laughs> Ronnie was a guitar player, and he was way better than me. Not only could he play Alex Lifeson's solos note for note, but he also looked the part, scrawny and skinny-legged with long blonde hair spilling over his shoulders. Though Ronnie lived in a bungalow near Silver Creek Park with his mom and dad, his brother Rob, and two family sedans, he looked like he'd woken up in a gulch. His face was moody and drawn without ever having touched dope or booze or speed, and the way he wore his guitar, a sunburst Les Paul with white humbuckers and gold knobs slung low across his midriff, suggested that he'd had it strapped across his bony shoulder since birth. Ronnie was the real thing. I was envious of him from the beginning. Ronnie and I started to jam. We sat at the edge of each other's beds on numberless afternoons, watched over by Rush's A Farewell to Kings poster. Getty Lee, Alex Lifeson, and Neil Peart standing arms crossed in front of a castle, long greasy hair dripping down their backs. And we strummed along to the records. Actually, Ronnie did most of the strumming. I studied him closely, copying riffs to Bastille Day, Temples of Syrinx, and of course, Xanadu, Rush's monumental work of oscillating synths wind chimes, ep epic poetry, and fast hiccuping bass lines. Ronnie and I saw lots of rock shows together, but most importantly, we saw Rush twice, the last time at the Gardens on their Hemispheres tour. One of the best moments came during the flash pot blasts and closer to the heart, when the whole crowd came alight, 16,000 faces hanging open as Alex, in his fringed robe, Karanged a D major chord, his wild eyes obscured by a car wash curtain of hair that whipped across his face as we yowled pangs of delight. <laughs> True. True, Alex. Don't deny it. But like a lot of kid friendships, the one between Ronnie and me just couldn't last. With the passing of time, as we hurdled grades in middle and high school, my ideas about music started to evolve. Soon I got into punk rock, and this drove a wedge between Ronnie and I. It happens. With change, certain people come to represent what you used to be, and that was the case with Ron and Rob for me. I made new friends, got into new bands, dressed differently. One weekend, I begged my parents to let me have a new wave party. They said that I could. I didn't invite Ronnie. 
Sometime during the party, there was a pounding on the door. When I opened it, Ronnie, Rob, and about five of their friends charged into the hallway. Ronnie waved an X-Acto knife and he came at me. He slashed the air and he screamed my name. I fell backwards against the stairs, holding up my hand for Ronnie to stop, but he wouldn't. It was a bewildering scene. My friends rushed up from the basement. Kenny Huff grabbed Ronnie and pushed him out of the front door. After a struggle on the driveway, he climbed back into his car. He had this strange, twisted look on his face, and as the car pulled away, one of his friends shouted out the window that he was going to find me after school and break my fingers. I thought of Ronnie and I thought of Rob when the Rio Statics got to record with Neil Peart in 1992. Neil came down to Reaction Studios while we were making our whale music album and set up a little yellow jazz kit in the corner. The Bare Naked Ladies were there too, singing backup vocals. We all huddled together and watched as Neil warmed up on his kit. Gone was his wild viney hair, fringed robe and shaggy mustache, but he was still a ghostly figure under the low studio lights. Head lowered, torso centered, feet kicking, his hands glancing over the drums, Neil played all afternoon. We were glued to the carpet, aware that we were listening to one of the greatest drummers in the history of music play. It's one thing to see your hero perform from a faraway seat in Maple Leaf Gardens, but it's something else to be so near his work as I was that day. Once upon a time in my life, I'd dreamed of what it'd be like to merely attend a Rush concert. Even before that, I'd booked my time after school around a chance encounter to see their video for Closer to the Heart on TV. And yet there I was, sitting on the studio parquet not 20 feet from where he was crafting a part for a song that would appear on our album. While Neil played, I thought about Ronnie, how he used to bend the fat strings of his Les Paul to play the vibrato riff of What You're Doing, his skinny wrists working the neck, his tongue curved over his lip, trying to get the riff just right. I thought about the sound of the suburbs, the sound of Rush, and what it had taken for me to be where I was living this rock and roll dream. As Neil commanded his kit, he painted my adolescence before me, evoking everything about it. And even though I sat alone, I imagined that Ronnie was there too, watching our hero as he played and played and played, tapping out rhythms of the heart for a kid who was once best friends with another kid, and they loved Rush. And tonight, they are the modern era inductees into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. Getty, Alex Neal, Rush. First of all, premièrement, songwriting award, Rush, there must be some mistake. <laughs> Mais, mais si c'est une erreur, nous en sommes très fiers et reconnaissants. Alors, si c'est une erreur, ça sera notre secret. <laughs> if it's true that every song is a story, every song has a story too. These five songs can tell some tales about our history. Les chansons sont les histoires, et les chansons portent des histoires. Our first five albums were all written on the fly, as it were, for we hadn't yet learned to insist on a little time for songwriting before making a record. In those years of near constant touring, we wrote songs in motel rooms, dressing rooms, rental cars, and backs to the wall in the studio. A Farewell to Kings was recorded in the summer of 1977, away from Toronto for the first time, in the wilds of Wales, where the sun never shone and the sheep never shut up. 
Lyrically, Closer to the Heart began with a verse by a friend of ours, Peter Talbot, from a sampler on his grandmother's wall. It showed a blacksmith at his forge with the caption, Mold it closer to the heart. Créer le travail plus près du cœur. Musically, the song was part of a deliberate expansion in our sound as we began to bring in keyboards, multiple guitars, and every kind of percussion noisemaker. In the spirit of the times, we also affected stage wear of alarming bathrobes and kimonos, <laughs> once described by a critic as absurdly prophetic robes. We had retired those robes by the time the spirit of radio came along in the summer of 1979. By then, we had also finally learned to take some time together just for songwriting, this time in a rented farmhouse near Bayfield, Ontario. Les amis dans la campagne pour écrire des chansons, luxe, calme et volupté. Alex's hobby back then was building radio-controlled airplanes and flying them over the surrounding hayfields. There were plenty of crashes and searches for lost wreckage. I imagine farmers around there are still plowing up pieces of those airplanes. <laughs> that Permanent Waves album was the first we recorded at Le Studio in the Laurentians in Quebec, one of many unforgettable projects we worked on in that beautiful place where I still have a home today. Le Québec est près de mon cœur. Lyrically, the spirit of radio was a celebration of the shared effect live radio, especially music, can have on the mood of your day. Musically, the song was our first response to the exciting musical changes going on around us in those late 70s. We were slowly channeling the trend toward becoming more concise, more driving, and more direct, while still retaining the stylistic quirks and indulgences that pleased us. Au travail, comme dans la vie, c'est nécessaire de s'amuser, n'est-ce pas? <laughs> By the time we made our next album, Moving Pictures, songs like Tom Sawyer and Limelight were concise for this band, driving direct with plenty of quirks and indulgences. Moving Pictures was written in Ronnie Hawkins' barn in the glorious summer of 1980 near Lakefield, Ontario, where another one of Alex's planes broke apart high in the sky and spiraled straight down into the roof of Ronnie's truck. <laughs> Once again, the album was recorded at the studio in Quebec, this time in midwinter. Comme le dit si bien le poète Gilles Vignon, mon pays ce n'est pas un pays, c'est libère. The success of that album was a great surprise to us, but it is interesting and gratifying to note that as with 2112, once we found our sound, we found our audience. Subdivisions was written during the mixing of our second live album, Exit Stage Left, back at Le Studio in the summer of 1981. Enfin et toujours l'été rebien. Subdivisions tells a story. It has a story, and it is a story, our story. We grew up in just those neighborhoods, in Toronto and St. Catharines, and felt the yearning expressed in that song. Misfits rebelling against conformity, watching friends settle for the same lives their parents had in the same subdivisions, while we were searching for something brighter, bigger, wilder. Well, as the saying goes, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Vous savez, les anges punissent en répondant aux prières. We got all that, bigger, brighter, wilder, and more. And even now, after almost 36 years together, we are once again embarked upon writing new songs. One big reason for our unaccountable longevity is that we have always been involved equally in creating our songs, words, and music. And another reason is that we continue to inspire each other and create music together that pleases us all. Chacun inspire l'autre, et cette inspiration nous aide à devenir meilleur. It should be remembered that a three-piece band cannot be a democracy. It's no good having two winning members and one who feels like a loser. We always aim to find... <laughs> <laughs> we always aim to find consensus, work that pleases all three of us. And though it is not always easy, it is surely that quality, above all, that has brought us here tonight. Nous sommes très, très reconnaissants d'avoir eu l'occasion de partager nos vies avec la musique. Mille merci, many thanks to the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame and to you all. You better carry that.